And today I'm going to be talking about power supplies, how they work, and which one to choose for your next project. Now before we get started, I'd like to give a special thanks to Kaiweets for sending me a brand new bench power supply to use for this video. I'm really excited to test this thing out. This power supply goes from 0 to 30 volts at 0 to 10 amps, which is a whole lot better than my old power supply, which only went from 0 to 18 volts at 0 to 2 amps. I'm really excited to see how this thing performs. It'll be very useful in this video. First off to clean a place on my desk for it though. Let's get started. Tanner, tech, tanner, tech, tanner, tanner, tech, tanner, tech, tanner. Hello, this is Tanner Tech. Let's start with a very simplified example of a linear power supply. This linear power supply uses a 2 and 3055 transistor, which is a very high wattage transistor, along with two other circuit elements, a resistor and a zener diode. Basically, these two circuit elements are going to make the transistor have a consistent voltage drop from its collector to emitter that's equal to the voltage drop of the transistor, which is 0.7 volts, plus the voltage of the zener diode, which is 6.3 volts. That means that if we put 12 volts on the input of the linear power supply, it would linearly regulate the voltage down to 5 volts. And if you change the current, the transistor would continue to keep that consistent voltage drop. You can think of it as a potentiometer that changes based off the current drop to keep a consistent voltage drop across it. Although a potentiometer is not a very good model for how a transistor works. One of the shortcomings of this is the amount of power dissipated in the transistor. There's a lot of waste here. So if you had 100 milliamps being drawn, 7 volts at 100 milliamps is going to be 700 milliwatts, or 0.7 watts of power lost in this transistor. You can see that linear power supplies are good. They don't produce any high frequency noise from switching. They just linearly step down one voltage to another but they do have the problem of wasting quite a bit of power. Now one problem with this circuit is that it is inherently unstable. It just doesn't have enough components. The output voltage will fluctuate. So to make this more stable, you can add an operational amplifier and some other circuit elements. That is actually done for us in some professionally made packages of regulators. I have here a LM7812 regulator and an LM 317 regulator. These are both TO220 packages and they contain all the circuit elements to make a regulator work. The only thing that you need to do, at least for the LM7812 regulator, is just ground one side. You put any voltage in one side and 12 volts comes out the other. For the LM317, you can add a voltage divider to the adjust pin to control the voltage output on the out pin. So these are pretty cool. Now when you want to supply power to your circuit using a battery, typically you just have the linear regulator in between with the resistor that makes it work if you're using the LM317. And then you typically add a capacitor before and a capacitor after to just make sure that voltage is smooth. Now when you want to power your circuit off AC voltage, you're going to need to have a transformer. Then you're going to have to have a full bridge rectifier, a smoothing capacitor, and a linear regulator before your circuit. So that is the essence of a linear regulator. They're not very efficient, but they're simple, and they don't make a lot of electrical noise. A good example of a linear power supply is found in my old bench power supply. You can see here that we have the big power transformer. In the back is where all the linear regulating happens. We have the four diodes that form a bridge rectifier, we have the big filter capacitor, and behind here, you can't see it because it's behind the board, is the very big transistor that is the main component of this linear regulator. In the back, there's this huge heat sink for dissipating all the heat from that transistor. I've noticed when I've used this to charge batteries and such, this heat sink gets very, very hot. Here's another good example of a linear power supply found on an Arduino board. This chip here is a linear regulator, and it's meant for stepping the voltage that you put in this port down to 5 volts to run the Arduino board. And this is probably going to be your most common usage of a linear power supply. On 
smaller projects, smaller boards that don't draw too much current. For instance, this Arduino only draws about 60 milliamps of current in its resting state, so not too much. Now let's talk about switching power supplies. Switching power supplies are very cool because they overcome a couple of the flaws of the linear power supplies. Namely, that they are more efficient, and they can not only step voltage down, but they can step it up. So here are three simple examples of switching power supplies. Here on the top we have a buck converter circuit. Of course this is very simplistic, it doesn't have any feedback, which it does in real life. But the buck converter steps voltage down from one voltage to another. And it does that using this transistor that is switched on and off. Now, the perk to doing this is when you have this transistor only in its on and off states, it saves energy. When you have it in its linear region, like we do in a linear power supply, then that energy is wasted. Transistor typically used here is a MOSFET, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. What happens here is when this is on, it lets voltage flow through this inductor and into a load. Now because that inductor is going to take a little bit of time for its magnetic field to grow, during that time there's going to be a voltage drop across it, which is going to lead to a lower voltage here. Now as soon as that inductor reaches its magnetic saturation, there's not going to be any voltage drop, and the voltage here is going to be the same as the input, which is why the transistor shuts off. When it shuts off, then the current then flows to the load through this diode and through the inductor again. It's still going to have a voltage drop across it, and the magnetic field is going to slowly decrease. So by varying the duty cycle of this, how long it's on versus how long it's off, we can change the output voltage. This circuit will always put out a voltage lower than the input voltage. For a boost converter, it's similar. We have a transistor that is being switched on and off at a certain frequency, at a certain duty cycle. What happens here is it's going to charge up this inductor to a certain magnetic field. And when that transistor turns off, the magnetic field is going to be discharged through the diode and into your circuit. We have filter capacitors smoothing both of these. This will always put out a higher voltage on the output than is going on the input. Here's a really cool demonstration of a boost converter working. I've got an inductor, capacitor, and diode down here, wired the same way in my circuit. But instead of a MOSFET transistor, I'm just going to be shorting it with a simple wire. See, on my multimeter, I have 5.06 volts, and on my power supply, I've got 5.43 volts. The voltage drop is just because of the diode. Now watch what happens when I short ground to the end of this inductor. Oh, 9 volts, 12 volts, 13, 14, 15.28 volts. That's crazy. So we're just boosting the voltage just by shorting the wire. Now if I was actually using a transistor going at a certain frequency and duty cycle, I would probably get that voltage a lot higher and get it there a lot faster. But that's just a really cool proof of concept to show how a boost converter works. This is the third type of switching power supply, the isolated switch mode power supply. We have here another transistor that's switching on and off a transformer. Now this transformer, depending on the winding ratio and also the duty cycle that this is switching at, we can control the output voltage. This is different than using a typical AC transformer because we're working at higher frequencies so the transformer can be smaller and have the same efficiency as a larger 60 hertz AC transformer. These circuits are operating somewhere at like 20 kilohertz. Now it's important in a circuit like this to have some kind of feedback mechanism where we have a circuit that reads the output voltage and then controls the duty cycle of the transistor to keep a constant output voltage. In the bottom circuit where we need isolation, that feedback can be controlled through something called an opto-isolator which is basically where we connect a infrared LED and a infrared phototransistor. So that way we can control the circuit but still have electrical isolation. This is a good example of a switching regulator. I have this in place in a circuit board that I built a while back. Here we have this integrated circuit and this contains the feedback mechanism and the transistor and things like that. We then have this, this is the inductor, the diode, and an input and output capacitors. This is acting as a buck converter right now. My new power supply from Kaiweets, which has a really cool color scheme by the way, is also another really good example of a switching power supply. Let me walk you through the circuit here. 
We have the input from the wall. Here's a varistor. This protects the circuit against surges. It increases its resistance as the voltage increases. We have here the AC line filter consisting of two capacitors and an inductor. That then goes into the bridge rectifier, which converts the AC into DC. That's filtered by these two capacitors. And then that goes into our main circuit here. These are two big MOSFETs that switch the power to this big transformer. This transformer is actually relatively small, but it can handle high amounts of current because it's being switched at a pretty high frequency. Now, the diode doesn't look like a typical diode because it's in a TO220 package and it's on a heatsink here. All these transistors are cooled by the fan. This inductor here actually isn't for the purpose of being a booster butt converter, but it's actually for filtering out any of the high frequencies generated by this transformer. We see here that there are some more transformers on the board, a little bit smaller than this main one. And I assume these are for powering the circuitry that controls this main transformer that switches on and off these transistors. It's also cool to see how on some of these boards, on the places that are isolated, they're not just electrically isolated, but the board is physically cut, so there is an air gap between these two parts of the board. You can see how well this circuit performs, as it delivers a very high amount of current to this resistor. I had dipped this in water previously, which is why it's sizzling. You can see it's drawing like 140 watts, and that thing is glowing red hot. The fan just kicked in on the power supply. This is awesome. That was what? 10 amps? 15 volts? That's a lot of power. This brings me to the main point of the video. What power supply to use for your own project? Now I guess this really depends on how you're powering your project, whether from the wall or from a battery, and how much current your project draws, or how susceptible it is to electronic noise. I think for the most part, if you're just using a small project that doesn't draw too much current, one of these wall wart switching adapters works great. Like for an Arduino, it's light, it's simple, you can plug it into the power port of it pretty easily. Now one thing to be aware of when using a small switching power supply is electrical noise. Especially if you're doing an, any kind of project that's sensitive to noise, like audio or some digital circuits. This noise is coming from a small wall wart switching power supply hooked up to my oscilloscope in the AC mode. You can see this AC noise is peaking at around 0.1 volts or even higher, which isn't good. This problem can be somewhat fixed using some low pass filters like an inductive choke, but nevertheless it still is a problem that's common to switching power supplies, but not with linear power supplies. This is especially bad when your circuit isn't drawing that much current. It also works well to use a linear power supply in some of these smaller low current projects like my old Christmas light controller, especially if the transformer is outputting a voltage that's close to the voltage you need. So you can see here this transformer is 13 volts. I need to power my circuit with around 12 volts. So I've got a linear regulator here. And this isn't wasting too much power, and even though this is not as efficient as a switching adapter, I don't really care too much because this is running off the wall, and so I'm not terribly worried about efficiency here. When it comes to higher current electronics projects, a linear regulator will not be good. It'll waste a lot of power. Like in my ZVS flyback driver, for instance, if I tried to put a linear regulator here, it would just get very hot and waste a lot of energy. A lot of times, if your circuit doesn't require a precise voltage to run, you can find a transformer that puts out that voltage, or you can rewind a microwave transformer to get the right voltage. But this still won't work very well for a circuit that requires a precise voltage at a high current. Luckily, there's a lot of high current switching power supplies that'll work for applications like this. For instance, this computer power supply is a switching supply, it's isolated, and it can provide 12 volts to 18 amps, supposedly. So there's a lot of different high current switching power supplies, and you can even modify computer power supplies like this to give a different voltage at a high current. When you're doing a project that's battery powered, typically, if your project is using only a few milliamps, it's best to use a linear regulator. They're simple, and you can just put it on your circuit board, and 
your project isn't going to be drawing too much current, so it's not going to waste too much power. But because it's so important to conserve energy when using a battery, because the more energy you use, the faster your battery dies, it's good to use switching regulators like this one. Actually, this one is set up to power a 9 volt jack from a 12 volt battery. So this is useful because this outputs the right voltage and it's very efficient. Now another great thing about using a switching power supply in a battery circuit is you can get a voltage higher than that of the battery. So something like this is a boost converter like we talked about earlier. This will step up the voltage. I use this for driving high current LEDs that require a lot more voltage than a battery has. This requires like 32 volts, but it very efficiently steps up that voltage from the battery. Now, when it comes to circuit boards, whether battery powered or not, it's important to consider board space as well as the other factors we've been discussing, because a switching power supply takes up a little bit more board space than a linear power supply. On that same note, when you're building an experimental PCB, it's a lot easier to put in place a linear power supply Linear power supplies are, are pretty simple, whereas switching power supplies typically involve surface mount components, which are a lot harder to mount when it comes to boards like this. Well, thank you for watching. I wasn't quite sure how to structure this video, so I hoped you learned something here. And remember to check out the description for the link to buy this Kaiweets power supply. This thing is awesome. Also, stay tuned for my next video, which might be about a high-powered mountain biking light, or it might be about my new Christmas light setup. Either way, I'll see you next time. Bye!